the princely states, you know, this kind of history still matters to our current politics in a certain measure. If you read the book of, um, the recent book, Ambassador Nirupama Rao wrote, uh, she talks about our attitude to China. When China took over Tibet, one of the reasons India sort of looked the other way was because we had taken over Hyderabad, and that was also spending in the un United Nations. So if, if you decided to be, let's say, holier than thou about Tibet, then somebody else, China could be holier than thou about Hyderabad, and that could create embarrassments for India. In a lot of the princely states, in 1971, the, the privy purses that were paid to the Rajas were abolished, but even now, India has officially recognized princes. We still have an official Zamorin of Calicut, who still paid an allowance by the government. We still have a prince of our court, who gets a police guard and an allowance from the government of India. There are still legal princes who exist in India. The bad name that they're sort of languishing with even after independence is partly all sort of their making, which was that having lost power, many of the Rajas set up hotels and tourist spots uh, in their erstwhile capitals, for which they also had an incentive to dress up in silks and look pretty. And so everybody just reduced them to the tourist brochure cliche, and they've been stuck with it since. And of course, the final piece is Mrs. Indira Gandhi. You know, she, of course, I begin the book with a quote from Indira Gandhi where she says, go ask your Maharajas how many wells they dug and how many roads they built when they were in power. You will find that the, the, the grand total of their achievements is zero. It's not true. But she was saying it not because she was a committed socialist, but because the privy purses being paid to the princes was being channeled by the princes towards opposition parties against the Congress's dominance. So a bit like the princes used their resources to goad the British once upon a time, in post-colonial India, they used their resources to needle the Congress party and support the Congress's opponents. It was for that reason that, the, that Mrs. Gandhi canceled the privy purses and said that the princes have to be wiped out of history and so on. And they were, legally speaking. But... To this day, they retain their relevance. If you go to a city like Trivandrum, when the Maharaja of Travancore walks on the road, he's just an ordinary figure. He's an ordinary citizen of a democratic state. But the moment he enters the Sri Padmanabha Swami temple, he again, tra again transforms into a Maharaja. And when he escorts the deity to the beach for the, for the ritual, uh, you know, Arat and so on, the great uh, ceremonies of the temple, he's escorted by police guards who are armed and they treat him very much as the Maharaja. And the international airport in Trivandrum even shuts down. The Mysore royal family at Dashara in Mysore to this day sit in public on their throne and the people come and pay them regard. In fact, they live in Mysore palace, which is occupied partly by the government and partly by the royal family because they still have this quasi-official uh, status over there. And finally, even if Maharajas have gone, the idea of kingship and the way of dealing with politics like Maharajas continues. Maharajas were what? You know, often they were custodians of religion, custodians of tradition. When our current prime minister, for example, goes to the, the, the Ayodhya temple consecration, for example, when he's seen performing religious rituals, Arvind Kejriwal in Delhi is also performing religious rituals, they're all tapping into an older form of legitimacy. They're all tapping into an older memory of cultural legitimacy, not constitutional legitimacy. They are essentially trying to fill the role that once upon a time Maharajas played. And Maharajas themselves, meanwhile, have adapted to democracy, which is why the Sindhyas of Gwalior are elected not only in Gwalior, but in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, all over the place. Which is why in, in Trivandrum, before every election, every candidate goes to the Kaudia Palace and takes a, has a photo op with the, uh, the royal descendants over there. When uh, Prime Minister Modi, as a candidate, came to Trivandrum in 2013, he actually went there and they gave him a shawl and put a, a little turban on his head and so on, almost as if they were endorsing a candidate for democratic elections. So the Maharajas, whatever their past may have been, they're still present very much in 21st century India, perhaps not with any kind of prominence, but certainly they haven't been wiped out completely, and certainly the story continues in a sort of small footnoted way. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.